Hello, it's Claire here. Just quickly before we start the show, I wanted to mention that I'm looking to connect with CIOs who are planning to hire information security leaders in 2020. If you're a chief information officer or a head of technology who has information security in your remit, and you might have a tactical technical team, but you need a strategic leader, please reach out to me at www.thesecurecio.com forward slash 2020. And I look forward to hearing from you. But now let's go to the show. Welcome to The Secure CIO, the podcast for technology executives who are tasked with hiring and retaining great cybersecurity leaders. Join best-selling author Claire Pales together with industry thought leaders as they answer your questions about sourcing the right leaders, building cybersecurity teams, candidate selection, salaries, skills, and more. Hello, I'm Claire Pales and welcome to The Secure CIO podcast. Our guest today is Graeme Thompson. Graeme is an independent consultant specialising in cybersecurity and information risk. He has had an extensive career in all facets of cybersecurity. He has broad experience in a wide range of roles, ranging from senior executive management positions through to senior technical roles. Graeme's most recent role was helping MLC Life separate from NAB and establish its cybersecurity capability. Other recent roles include working as Optus's Executive Cybersecurity Lead for the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast, General Manager for Information Security and Assurance for NBN, and the CISO for the Commonwealth Bank. Graham is a lifelong learner who is passionate about cybersecurity and increasing importance with the modern day evolution of technology in our everyday lives. Graham, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Uh, hello and welcome. So tell us a little bit more about how you came to be a security leader. We've heard a bit in your bio, but how did you get to this point in your career and what attracted you about the security industry? Yeah, I guess my uh, journey to becoming a security leader was more of an evolution than a specific career plan. Uh, I was initially attracted to the IT industry as it was interesting and I knew it would play a big part in the future. Uh, I took on uh, a control analyst position early in my uh, career with uh, the IBM Data Centre and was also studying part-time for my computer science degree. And was, this was a time when mainframe computers uh, were uh, starting to uh, have security applied to them and I took on the role of a RACF administrator. For those who know, that was the, the security platform for mainframes at the time. During that role, I guess, uh, as RACF administrator, uh, I was frustrated by the ability of system programmers to use their elevated privilege capabilities to undermine the security controls that had painstakingly put in place. And to meet this challenge, I became a system programmer while maintaining my security responsibilities, you know, using the philosophy, if you can't beat them, join them. And uh, over time, and with gaining experience and exposure to many of IBM's business and government customers, I acquired technical and business skills that enabled me to be recognised as a leader in the information security field. Amongst other things, this included performing penetration test demonstrations throughout Asia Pacific to raise the awareness for the need for security controls. And I guess it was around the 1990s that the use of the internet started to explode. And new business channels, especially in business and financial services, exposed organisations to untrusted environments. This, and along with increasing adoption of end-user devices, uh, changed the dynamic of an organisation's security risk profile. Information security, or cybersecurity as it has become known, changed from being viewed as an IT problem to being a business risk issue. This change was pivotal in my career as the need for cybersecurity skills soared. You spent quite a bit of time working for yourself and providing consultancy and advisory services. How do you see consultants fitting into security teams? Do you think that they can have the same impact and influence as a permanent employee can have uh, in an organisation? Organisations are uh, continuously evolving and changing, especially where information and digital transformation is involved and consultants are a necessity in transformation projects as they can provide the skills and experience to enable the success of these initiatives. I guess something to be mindful of uh, with these initiatives is the need to ensure that consultants interact with the permanent full-time employees of the security teams. Uh, this is imperative for knowledge transfer of the new systems as well as passing on the rationale as to why specific security design decisions have been made. Another important reason for security team to work closely with the project teams is to ensure 
that a design to operate philosophy is incorporated into the design of the systems and processes of the new ecosystem. This ensures that the existing operational processes and obligations are maintained. And uh, I guess too often I've seen the lack of integration detract from the success of the initiative where consultants are used to augment the capacity and skills of the business as usual security team. It's important for the consultant to become a member of the team and share the successes and failures of that team. Uh, Some of the best adoptions of outsourcing that I've seen is where the security professionals from third parties are able to seamlessly integrate the processes from the third party organisation with those of the client's organisation. This helps drive successful outcomes in the outsourcing arrangements particularly in areas such as security operations and penetration testing. I think that seamlessness is so important as um, an organisation sort of takes on the systems and processes that that third-party consultant is trying to provide. And often, as you said, the parts of the business may not even realise that the person's a consultant if if they're able to so clearly become part of the project team or, or part of what's going on. You know, I mean, that's what you're after, I guess, is that immersion of the consultant in in the business and so they just become a part of of what's going on. Yeah, I guess that is a a special skill of the uh, individuals within that uh, outsourcing organisation and I guess it tells the good ones uh, from the the ones who are still learning. Absolutely. You've led some security teams for large-scale events like we mentioned um, the Commonwealth Games. What was it like to build a team that you knew would only be coming together for a short time? So how do you ensure they are cohesive and effective, given the high stakes of what you've got to protect, and yet it's such a short-term engagement. The Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast during uh, April 2018 was a really interesting and challenging engagement for me. Uh, let me provide a little bit more context. Uh, most of the, uh, the Games environment was built in the six months leading up to the Games. Uh, there was a Queensland government business enterprise called Goldock ran the games and used a multitude of outsourced service partners. And a fibre network was used to provide all network traffic, including TV broadcasts. It's fair to say that failure was not an option. And from a security perspective, it was all about the mission. The fact that it had to be successful meant that individuals brought a willingness to help frame of mind. This lean in attitude from the combined virtual security team was consistent across all service providers and enabled end-to-end problems to be analysed and dealt with rapidly. The mission purpose ensured the cohesion and effectiveness across the team. Another perspective was uh, the hands-on executive sponsorship, which meant that problems could be escalated immediately and handled without undue bureaucracy. Some of the uh, success factors that helped deliver the successful security outcomes for the Games included a well-architected environment that compartmentalised the different network traffic groups. This led to a good understanding of the network and what constituted good normal traffic. Along that, we had a comprehensive threat modelling exercise that was undertaken to know what attack vectors to look for and then testing the combined game's operational response by applying a practice, practice, practice mentality to the cybersecurity drills. There's also a heightened vigilance with security monitoring in the lead up to and during the games, utilising technology that alerted when abnormal traffic was detected on the network segments enabled immediate response activity. And with this heightened vigilance, we also had uh, human eyeballs monitoring the security logs alongside the regular seam alerting. Uh, Where unusual events were identified on the files and IPSs, these were swiftly correlated with the seam and other security logs to isolate the false positives. And I guess finally, a strong technical and management presence within the technical operations centre during the Games meant that there was a high calibre of skills and experience available to deal competently with any operational issue. You know, I love this mentality of practice, 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 because I don't think enough organisations practice their incident response plans or how they would respond to even a small-scale incident, let alone you know, some of the incidents that I'm sure you would have been practising your response to as part of that that process. So I loved that idea that, you know, you just practised all the time even though people knew what their roles were to play. And then the other part of that around that sort of um, 
the due diligence that you had technology that was managing and monitoring for you and yet you had the human side almost validating um, what was going on with the technology as well. I mean, that's, I know it's probably security um, operations on steroids, but it had to be that way. But as you say, you know, there's a lot to be learnt from these um, these operations that are quite um, intensive that we could then play back in the enterprise. It was fair to say it was a lot of fun as well, and uh, uh, and that was an important aspect uh, for the individuals that worked on the on the games. So, if you were building a team again, as in building out a new team, not necessarily for a an event such as that, but but in an organisation, and you were the first to arrive, you're the CISO, who would you hire next? Who's your first hire and, and why would you go down that path? If you're going into an existing security uh, capability with an organisation, you know, your hiring is very much around uh, understanding you know, the existing capability and, and then recruiting to the specific needs according um, to the need and priority but I guess uh, let's, uh, let's assume that this is a Greenfields team in a new organisation that we're building. Uh, and my first uh, security hire would be uh, an experienced and pragmatic security architect, uh, someone who can bridge both the business process architecture side of things as well as the technical security needs for the organisation. Yeah, I guess the phrase, a stitch in time saves nine, yeah, holds true here. It is, uh, it's very much the design and uh, build security into systems and processes at the get-go rather than trying to uh, shoe- shoehorn them in the end. And uh, it's fair to say it's been a long bugbear of mine uh, where a uh, project approaches the security team at the 11th hour to help address security considerations. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's usually a suboptimal outcome as a, you know, in a result of these circumstances. And if I could add, I guess, uh, you know, my second security hire would uh, likely be uh, someone who can uh, be a security advocate to the business, you know, a security champion, if you will, an individual who can engage with business stakeholders and business analysts and instill good security practices and awareness into processes across the whole uh, enterprise. Uh, when a business stakeholder is aware of the security risks that they are accountable for and what in many instances can be a straightforward solution, it is more likely that it will be implemented. For those listeners of the podcast who have been listening since the first episode of the first season, they will know that I ask this question on a regular basis around, you know, who would be your first hire and consistently the architect comes out as that first hire. And so, you know, I mean, if if we're looking for trends, I think the idea that that person is that next hire is so critical to how the security team is going to operate going forward. You know, I love the idea that the next person would be someone who really is going to engage with the business more so than an architect does, but more just, I guess, on an enterprise-wide or a general level and really understand what the business risks are and how security can play a role in mitigating those. So in terms of building teams out, what sort of hurdles have you faced? And and have you found that different organisations you've worked in has caused you or presented different hurdles in building out a team? Yeah, I guess a common hurdle that I've faced uh, is convincing the powers that be that an additional headcount is required and justified. And uh, I know that's uh, true for many organisations uh, facing that challenge. Uh, and you know, Depending on where a business finds itself in, uh, in the cycle, uh, if uh, there's an imposed hiring freeze, then getting that additional headcount approved you know, always requires extra effort. An interesting approach that uh, one organisation that I worked for uh, is known as the six green lights technique. Uh, this was used for senior security positions and required that the candidate be interviewed by six individuals, including business stakeholders, HR and security line management. Any red light given by any of the six interviewers will disqualify the candidate. The upside of this approach uh, is when the candidate is eventually selected, there is a high success rate for the individual to be successful in the organisation. There is a downside, however, in that the additional time and effort required to recruit into the role. Uh, This has a side effect on other security team members having to carry the additional workload burden of that unfilled role. And I guess uh, another security team building approach that I've had some success with is where uh, I hire within the organisation. You can source enthusiastic and pragmatic individuals who are intelligent, keen to learn and broaden their career. 
and the extra effort required to teach them the necessary security skills is countered uh, with uh, corporate knowledge, business context, know-how and the common sense that they bring with them. It's interesting you say about the six green lights technique because I wrote a blog recently about the interview process and how it's starting to concern me that we're interviewing someone on two occasions for one hour and then we're trying to make a decision about whether or not they're the right security leader for an organisation. And, you know, some organisations throw in a third interview, some organisations throw in some psychometric testing, but essentially at the end of the day it's a very short process and, you know, thinking about these six green lights and and the the more people that interview someone and and get a feel for whether or not they're the right person for the organisation, you know, it certainly makes sense that you would get a better retention rate out of that and it's a better strategy for hiring than, than just a simple interview process that I think a lot of organisations still follow. Yeah, as I said, uh, we did have a lot of good success with it. It's just um, it's a bit of a pain to go through. I mean, we typically uh, did three lots, three interviews where two people uh, from the organisation attended the interview. So, you know, three times two for the six. But nevertheless, it was, yeah, it's quite uh, onerous in terms of uh, uh, effort required for both the candidate and uh, the individuals of the organisation. Yeah, and I guess the thorough nature of what you're doing, you know, you're sort of doing the hard thinking up front so that you have longevity out of that candidate. And you know, it's probably a good uh, segue into the next question they want to ask you. And you've spent a lot of um, large sections of your working career with particular organisations. So retention in security is an issue. Um, what's been your reason for sticking around with particular organisations for long periods of time? Yeah, I guess um, reflecting on my career and, you know, I have spent many years in some organisations, uh, though within those organisations I have regularly uh, changed roles. Uh, these were large corporations where, you know, there's very many business areas and, and opportunities and I guess that uh, meant that I did not feel my career was stagnant or boring. Um, also um, took some rotations that took me uh, outside of uh, direct security-focused roles for a period of time. Uh, roles such as being a people leader and a sizable customer technical support team where the team members provided troubleshooting services to large corporations and other roles uh, such as enterprise security architecture and application development within the banking and finance sector. Within these roles, it gave me the additional experience and empathy and capability for when I did step back into a security role. Uh, I guess another reason for sticking around an organisation is that I do get a tremendous sense of achievement and pride in delivering large initiatives for the organisation. Often uh, these are multi-year programs of work where time goes by rapidly, uh, but it is good to look back and say, I helped build this. It is uh, retention within a security team is very much a challenge for security leaders and they need to step up uh, to provide uh, individuals reason to stay with the organisation. Uh, some of these reasons are, you know, a combination of a good team dynamic uh, where the work is both challenging and in interesting, uh, where the team can generate its own fun and, uh, and also uh, the successes of the team are celebrated. Uh, it's, it's very much the role of security leader to facilitate this culture. It is hard in a security team to feel like you're achieving things you know, we don't like to look at security as a project. We like to look at it as a way of doing business. But it is hard when, you know, day in, day out, you're really looking for the negative things or the, the incidents that are going on in a business. And so, you know, to have a group of people who are, are really focused on, you know, what can we say that we succeeded or achieved on in particular projects or particular parts of the year, it certainly makes a difference, I think, to that cohesion of a, of a team that wants to stick together. Providing those opportunities such as secondments uh, into other areas and, and, and really you know, getting that interaction happening so that someone doesn't feel like it's, it's a, just a, a drudge to turn up to work. I mean, uh, cybersecurity is a great challenging area where you can actually uh, enjoy what you're doing. What do, would you say have been some of your key lessons that you've learned about building teams over your career? Uh, other lessons learned in building security teams are supporting the team with empowerment and responsibility and ownership, uh, encouraging innovation, uh, make it known that it is okay for the team to try something new and, and have it fail. Uh, the important thing is to learn from uh, the mistakes. Uh, I guess it's cliched, but uh, it's important that the security team 
be seen as an enabler for the organisation's business success. The security team should not be embroiled in dogma that stifles the organisation. Uh, security teams uh, need to work within the risk appetite of the organisation uh, and accountability of the security team is to ensure management are fully informed of the security risks associated with the decisions that the business are making. Uh, and uh, security teams need to be that trusted advisor and need to provide truthful and balanced guidance on threats and risks. It should not uh, over-dramatise situations, but conversely, it should not deliberately underplay situations. I guess I could go on with uh, numerous other lessons learned, but uh, I'll, I'll close with one final one, which is to foster uh, appropriate communication within the organisation. Uh, this is particularly necessary when dealing with senior executives. Keep that interaction succinct yet informative. I like to ask all my guests the same final question, and that is uh, what advice would you give your 20-year-old self about teams and leadership? Do you think it would be the one you've just said about business engagement? Yeah, it's, it certainly is business engagement. Uh, it's becoming very important because security is, is very much that uh, business problem now. It's, it's everyone in the organisation's uh, issue. It's not just the security team. And uh, I guess uh, the other key messages for the 20-year-old self would be uh, to prepare for and embrace change. I mean, we're in uncharted technology advantages that have happened in recent times. Uh, and uh, we can expect more of this to come. Um, you know, governance over data assets, privacy considerations, they're all placing challenging demands on cyber security, as well as compliance and regulatory obligations that are being legislated. Uh, the challenge is to keep these real, consistent and affordable. Um, yeah, for my 20-year-old self, my advice is to make uh, the effort to keep your skills current across uh, the dimensions of people, process and technology. And uh, along with this, embracing change, uh, this will lead to an exciting, rewarding and purposeful career. Perfect. Um, thank you so much. You've had such a varied career and um, I certainly think that our listeners will take some key items out of our chat today, um, especially I love the part about the, the Commonwealth Games. I just, I'm fascinated by the idea that you could bring a team together like that and, and be so effective and um, so I'm really grateful for your time and, and thanks very much for joining us. My pleasure. That's all we have time for today. Thanks so much for listening. For more information on all our guests, check out the show notes at thesecurecio.com where you can also find more information on the Secure CIO framework and sign up for my newsletter. If you loved the show, please subscribe to the podcast and feel free to leave me a five-star rating. I'll see you next week.